Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 19 through 23. And this is what it says. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Pray with me. Jesus, the Bible tells us a long time ago, you, you breathed on your disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit this day. May we do exactly that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Years ago, I had a woman in my church that uh, she, anytime there was a little spare moment or two, she would tell me a story. It was always the same story. She was a wonderful woman. She was in her 90s. And the story every time would start the same way. I don't know if I told you the story or not. And I knew it was going to be the same story, but I enjoyed it. And it was a story about when she was in her 80s that um, she had had surgery. And when she got out of surgery, she was in the recovery room. That's when she woke up and the Presbyterian minister was standing over her. And his first words were, oh, I thought you were dead. Did you smell fire and ashes? <laughs> well, she never had any explanation, but she would always tell it with a little grin on her face. I wasn't sure if she was sharing it to say, well, this was his way of starting evangelism with me. Or she had, he had doubts about her being Methodist. I wasn't real sure why, and I was a little bit afraid to ask. But she loved telling that story, and she always told it with a, a grin on her face. We all have stories that we love to tell. Sometimes those stories put a grin on her face. Sometimes those stories are, are stories that are, are very serious stories. Sometimes they're stories of sadness. But stories, stories, they're, they're the way that we make it through. This morning we came to hear the story. 
People are gathered from all over the world to hear this story. It's a story that has been repeated millions and millions and millions of times. It's a story that it was repeated verbally before it was ever written down by the gospel writers. But the gospel writers all, though there's some, some variations in the detail, the main pieces are all remarkably consistent. And that the first point of the story is that God sent his only son, Jesus. And that's the the first big, most important point of the story. God sent his only son, Jesus. It's so we would... We would know the nature of God, so we would know that God is good and loving God. And Jesus did that through everything that he said, through everything that he did. That he came giving sight to the blind. He came restoring those who were broken, those who were brokenhearted. He came to make whole, to give strength healing and wholeness and forgiveness to a broken world. Well, you would think that after giving God's very best to God's very own, that people would rise up and say thank you, but that's not what happened at all. That people conspired with envy, with hate, with evil, to kill him. And that's what they did. It was an inside job. They got one of his closest disciples. We know how the story goes. It was Judas. They got him to betray him. Well, he didn't catch Jesus off guard. As a matter of fact, that on the last night of Jesus' life, he got his disciples together. He brought them into an upper room, and he told them that he was going to die the next day. And he even said that one of them would betray him one of them would deny him and that they would all flee. They all made sure to claim that they would never do that, not ever, but that's exactly what happened. Just a few hours later, Jesus was with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was Judas who was leading this awkward band of temple guards and Roman soldiers right up to Jesus. And it was with a kiss that he turned Jesus over to them. Well, it's not like they they took Jesus off kicking and screaming. With a word, Jesus said, whom do you seek? And they all fell to the ground. He had power enough, power here on this earth, to shake off death. But that's not what he did. That he faced death. He faced the hate. He faced the envy. He faced the sin. And when it did its worst, he took his cross up to the top of that hill called Golgotha and they nailed him to the cross. And it was there that he nailed the hate. He nailed the the envy. He nailed the evil, the death, and the sin. And he took away its power. There on the cross, you would expect one who was betrayed, one who was turned over to his enemies, you would expect him to to cry out in curses like anyone else. But that's not at all what we find. From the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They pierced his side with a spear to make sure that he was dead. Well, the the Roman soldiers knew exactly about death. They, They were skilled in death. And when the Romans killed you, you stayed dead. And that's the second point. As incredibly consistent, throughout the Gospels, Jesus died on the cross. That he wasn't like the spring, oh, just wait, and he'll, he'll come back later. 
He wasn't like a caterpillar that, uh, you know, he's going to transform and he'll be back just like he was or even better. He'll be a butterfly this time. Nope. Dead was the word. And you ask any of the disciples, that's what they would say. He died. They didn't say he was just a little bit dead or they thought he was dead. No, he was dead. And so they buried him. It was the night before the Sabbath. And when dusk came, they had to stop their preparation. The Sabbath day came, the Sabbath day went. And it was Mary Magdalene on the third day, while it was still dark, went to Jesus' tomb. She went so as soon as the sun came up, she could continue the preparations. But what she saw, the stone was rolled away. The huge stone that was there to seal his grave, it was, it was rolled away. And this is the third point, the third point that, that is consistent wherever the gospel is preached, that the grave was empty. Now, she didn't understand yet what had happened. When she saw that the stone was rolled away, she ran to go tell Peter and the other disciples. And when they came, Peter and John ran to the tomb. John was a little younger, so he got there first. He ran and stopped at the, at the, at the opening of the tomb. Peter was a little older, and he got there just behind, and he ran straight into the tomb. When Peter saw that the grave clothes were rolled up to the side, well, that's not the way robbers do. They don't make sure things are nice and neat and tidy when they rob a grave. John followed on into the grave, and it says a strange thing. The Bible says they saw and they believed. Well, we don't know exactly what they believed. They saw that the tomb was empty, but we don't know what they believed because the very next thing it says is that they, they went home and shut the doors for fear. They hid at home because they were still afraid. It was Mary who stayed there at the grave. She was weeping, and when she looked into the tomb again, she saw two angels, one sitting at the head and one sitting at the feet where Jesus had been, and they said, woman, why are you weeping? Well, she turned around and Jesus was standing there. She didn't recognize that it was Jesus because you remember when the Romans kill people, they stay dead. She, and Jesus said to her, whom do you seek? She thought he was the gardener and said, if you can tell me where you've taken him, let me know, and I will carry his body away. But that's when Jesus called her by name. That's an important part. Jesus called her by name. He said, Mary, just like he used to. That's when she recognized him. She fell at his feet. She said, Rabboni. Jesus said, stop clinging to me for I have not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Go tell the disciples. Go tell the disciples. But it's, it's at that point right there that Jesus, Jesus who's a, a, ascended to heaven, that Jesus has given us great hope for tomorrow. That's why we tell the Easter story. That's why we repeat the story again and again, because it gives us hope for tomorrow. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Jesus has ascended to, to his Father and our Father, and that heaven is no longer some strange far-off place. Because Jesus, Jesus, who's called you and me and Mary by name, has made it home. Christine Federa, Louisville, Kentucky, 
sent a story into Reader's Digest a few years back. It was a story about a time when her husband, an electrician, was asked to rewire their church's confessional. Well, the only way to redo the wiring was to crawl up into the attic and, and bounce across the, a beam in the ceiling in order to, to make sure that the wires that were going down in the sanctuary to the confessional were wired correctly. Well, Christine was, was fearful for her husband, balancing way up in the ceiling there in the church. So she sat down in one of the pews, waiting for him and watching and making sure that he didn't get in any trouble. She didn't know that there, were, there was a group of people out in the hall that were congregating, and they were quiet because they thought that Christine was just in the sanctuary praying and praying alone. They became very excited and agitated when Christine screamed out, Sam, Sam, are you up there and are you okay? Well, they became completely unhinged when a voice from the ceiling shouted back, Yes, I made it up here just fine. <laughs> well, that's the message of Easter. For those of us who've lost loved ones, someone to death, it's comforting to know that Jesus Jesus who's called us by name, that he is up there and that he has made it just fine and he's prepared a place. He's prepared a place for those of us who's lost someone to death. C.S. Lewis said that when his friend Charles William died, that, that he wrote something that he never thought he would ever write. That C.S. Lewis said he wrote something that, that he had always thought as just some kind of sentimental claptrap. But when his friend Charles William died, he said, Since Charles William died, heaven is no longer a strange and a far off place. That Jesus is there, it's a place that he's provided. Yes, for Charles William. Yes, for you and for me. Yes, for all of us who've gone before. So, so we have hope, a hope, a hope for tomorrow. And for many folks, the story stops right there, but it does not. That the story continues on because Jesus told Mary, go and tell Peter and the disciples, and that's what Mary did. She reported to Peter and the disciples that she had seen Jesus and that he was alive. Peter and the disciples were there locked behind closed doors when Jesus appeared to them. Jesus showed them his hands where they were pierced by the nails. We read that this morning, that Jesus showed them his side where it was pierced by the spear. And then something that seems quite unusual to us, he said, peace be with you. And then we read this morning, he said that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what God did to Adam. In Genesis chapter 2, that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living being. That life, life, it comes from the breath of God. And that's what Jesus did. He gave us life in the here and the now, not just in the hereafter. A life of strength, a life of power that we don't have on our own. It was given to Peter. It was given to the disciples. And it's a life that's given to you and to me. Yes, Jesus has given us hope for tomorrow. But he's given us strength for today. Strength for today. William Fry was an Episcopal bishop in Colorado. He shared a story from his early years that when he was younger, he had volunteered to read to a university student who was blind. And in reading to this university student, his name was John, 
that he got to know him quite well. And then he asked John, when did you come to be blind? John said that it was when he was 13 years old. There was a chemical explosion. And that, that was, it was in that explosion that he became blind. And that immediately he became very, very, very angry. 13-year-old who had seen well and all of a sudden one day he couldn't see at all. He said he stayed in his room for six months. He ate all of his meal, meals there. And he just began to stew and become more and more angry until the day that his father came to him and said, winter's coming and the storm windows need to be put on the house. That's your job and I want it done by this evening when I come home. His father left the room and shut the door behind him. John said that's when he became very, very angry. And he said, how does he expect me to do that? He knows that I can't see. And then he became so angry, he said, well, I proved him. I proved him. I'll show him. And so he made his way down to the garage, and he found the garage. He found the ladder. He found the tools, and he found the storm windows. He said to himself, muttering the whole time, I'll show them. I'll show them. I'll be on that ladder. And because I'm blind, I'll fall off. And then they'll have a son that's not only blind, but paralyzed too muttering to himself the whole time. Well, by the end of the day, he had put up the storm windows. But the story doesn't end there. That John went on to share with William Fry. He said, I found out later that never at any moment was my father more than four or five feet away from my side. That's the story of Easter for you and for me. That when Jesus rose from the grave and he breathed his Holy Spirit, he breathed to you and to me a power that's not just five feet away, but it's as close as our very own breath. It's the risen Christ alive today in you and me, giving us strength that, that we don't have a strength for today, and a hope for tomorrow. This morning, I don't know where you are and I don't know what you've been through, but hear the story. It's the story of Jesus who fought sin and death for you and for me, that we might have hope, hope for tomorrow. He conquered all that would conquer us. And when he rose from the grave, he breathed on us to give us strength, strength for today, for you and for me. Now, it may be that you're in that place that you've been like John. You've been muttering about life's not fair, that something you're in, something you've gone through is terrible. And it just may be terrible. Suffering is terrible. Jesus came to this earth not so he can, could, could lift his hands and say, see, no scars, no scratches. He showed hands inside to let us know. He knows just how hard this world really is. And he conquered it for you and for me. This morning, I invite you to ask his spirit to live within you. And you can begin every day, every day, and all day long begin it with a conversation where you talk, where you listen, and you obey his will. And little by little, step by step, his will becomes our will. Pray with me now. Jesus, this day, it's a day of strength. It's a day of hope. It's a day 
that together we remember you fought sin and death on our behalf that we might rise a renewed, a strengthened people not just to do what we want but to do what you will. We need your strength to do that. No matter what folks are going through, we always need your will. It may be a death, it may be a suffering, it may be a difficult time, or it may be the best time ever in life. No matter what it is, we always need your strength. Breathe that strength on us this day. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We wanna be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.